Hey guys, this is Dan from World Must Agree, coming to you with a different kind of video this time. Um, I like listening to podcasts. When I'm in work, because i got got quite a boring bloody job sometimes, I tend to listen to podcasts. It could be a podcast about conspiracies. I like a good conspiracy, paranormal, science. I, I like a lot of science podcasts. I like listening to stuff like about serial killers. Which this is probably going to get me demoralized, but I just thought I'd have to. I need to talk about this particular case I heard about. I'm going to uh, now. If you know the case already about um, William George Hirons, I'm not going to give you anything new you already don't know, right? So if you've come here to thinking I've found some shit, I haven't, right? But I want to go over some stuff and give my opinion at the end yeah so i listen to a lot of podcasts and one of them is a serial killer podcast out of morbid curiosity like we all all do you know interest in old old cases old stories and i started listening to one the other day I'll, I'll link all the sources down below by the way and i started listening to one the other day they started talking about this guy called william george hirons i'd never heard of him before you know you've heard of the usual ted bundy jeffrey dahmer um BTK, all that kind of stuff. You've, you've heard about them. You hear about them in every single serial killer documentary. It's the same people they always cover. So when I started listening to this one about William George Hirons, I thought, I've never heard of this person. How come I've never heard of this person? Because I've watched a lot of stuff. I've listened to not a lot of stuff. And I've read a lot of stuff about that. So I was listening. And as it went on, I, they were describing you know, his crimes and what have you. Supposedly um, murdered three people and he went to prison i'm going to go through the his, enti his entire story in a minute i'll be reading off wiki i know wiki is sometimes unreliable but i know for a fact that some of the stuff i've already seen in it i've seen in other sources and i've also seen in some of the books i haven't read the books but i've seen snippets from those books which i'm actually going to get actually because they're quite interesting bear in mind that anything I, i'm about to read you know from early life onwards this might be a long video this might be a different kind of video to what you usually see from me but i just thought this is something on my mind the last couple of days since i heard this episode but anyway so i'm gonna read from the top okay now like i said this is available to everyone this is all public knowledge anyone can look this up and you know like i said there might be things which you can't quite verify because it was from 1945 but we'll get to that. But anyway, William, I'm, I'm reading word for word here. And I'll, I'll probably skip and change some words for the for the purpose of this video. Like I said, it's probably going to de get demonetized anyway. But it's something I want to talk about. William George Hirons, November 15th, 1928, was an American criminal and possible serial killer. Notice how they use the word possible. And I'll get to that. And it's in, it, it blows my mind, actually. But I will get to that. Was a possible serial killer who confessed under police torture and to a to and was subsequently controversially convicted of three murders in 1946. Hirons, Hirons was called the Lipstick Killer after a notorious message scrawled in lipstick at a crime scene. At the time of his death, Hirons was reputedly Illinois' longest serving prisoner, having spent 65 years in prison. So he died in prison, don't forget that. He died in t March 2012. Uh, he spent the later years of his sentence at the Dixon Correctional Center in Dixon, Illinois. Though he remained imprisoned until his death, Hirons had recanted his confession and claimed to be a victim of coercive inter interrogation and police brutality. Now, we're going to get to some stuff, like um, viewer discretion is advised if you're squeamish about stuff. I'm going to try and not go into too much detail, but there are going to be some things explained about certain murders. So, you know, buckle up. So, Hirons grew up in Lincolnwood, a, sub a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. He's the son of George and Margaret Hirons. George Hirons was the son of immigrants from Luxembourg and Margaret was a homemaker. His family was poor and his parents argued incessantly. Hirons would wander the streets to avoid listening to his parents arguing all the time. So, he liked to get out of the house, you know, because who wants to listen to their parents argue. He took to crime and later claimed that he mostly stole for fun and, released, and to release tension. He never sold anything he had stolen. At 13 years old, Hirons was arrested for carrying a loaded gun. A, sub a subsequent search of the Hirons' home discovered a number of stolen we weapons hidden in an unused storage shed on the roof of a nearby building, along with furs, suits, cameras, radios and jewellery. Hirons admitted to 11 burglaries and was sent to Gib Gibalt School for wayward boys for several months. Soon after, he was arrested for theft and sentenced to three years at the St. Bede, 
Bede, Bede, I don't know how to pronounce that, where he was an exceptional student. He was accepted into the University of Chicago's special learning program. Like I said, I'm going to leave out certain details for the purpose of this video, but I'll link all the sources down below. Josephine Ross, on June 5th, 1945, 43-year-old Josephine Ross was found dead in a Chicago apartment. She had been repeatedly stabbed and her head was wrapped in a dress. Dark hairs were clutched in her hand. No valuables were taken from the apartment. Police were unable to identify a dark complete reportedly seen loitering nearby or running away. Now, notice they say that no valuables were taken from the apartment. Um, throughout William's history, he was just a thief. He was a petty criminal. He burglared houses. No, don't get me wrong. Burglaring in houses, stealing off people, shit bag stuff, right? Shit stain, but stuff. But he was just that, a petty criminal growing up. But in this case of Josephine Ross, there was no valuables taken. Bear that in mind. The second one was Francis Brown. On December 10th, 1945, Francis Brown was discovered with a knife lodged in her neck and a bullet wound to the head in her apartment. Nothing was taken. Again, nothing was taken. But a message was written in lipstick on the wall, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Police found a bloody fingerprint smudge on the door, dram door jam of the entrance door. We'll get to that fingerprint in a bit now, because when I... When I read about this, it, it blew my mind, actually. A witness heard gunshots at about 4 a.m. and the building's night clerk said a nervous man, a 35 to 40 years old. Now, in, in 1945, in 1945, William was 17 years old, right? But they described a nervous man of 35 to 40 years old and weighing 140 pounds, got off the elevator and left. At one point, Chicago police said they had reason to believe the killer was a woman. It doesn't go into detail why they thought that... I'm sure there's some detail somewhere on the internet or in a book somewhere, but they don't go here. Next one was Susan Degner. Now this one is, don't get me wrong, they're all bad, but this one is particularly bad. I am going to leave out some details of this because it was a six-year-old girl, but anyway. On January 7, 1946, six-year-old Susan Degner was discovered missing from her first floor bedroom at Edgewater, Chicago. Police found a ladder outside her window and a ransom note. Get $20,000 ready and wait for my word. Do not notify the FBI or police. Bills are in fives and tens. Burn this for her safety. A man repeatedly called the Degnans re residence demanding a residence, uh, demanding a ransom. Now the Degnans, now the, Deg the Degnan family, the family, the father was a senior OPA executive recently transferred to Chicago and he was in charge of uh, extending rationing to dairy products and you had a meat packers strike at the time. So there's a lot of angry people around at that time, angry, angry at that family. The Degnan family, okay? Acting on an anonymous tip, police discovered Degnan, the six-year-old girl's remains, I'm not going to go into detail, in the sewer a block from the Degnan res residence. Just listing off various parts, I'm not going to go into that. Um, blood was found in the drains of the laundry tubs in the basement laundry room of a nearby apartment building. Police questioned hundreds of people, gave polygraph examinations to about 170, and several times claimed to have captured the killer, though all were eventually released. released. That's another thing which you when you when you listen to this full story that the police they they had six I think it's six main uh, culprits they arrested six people saying this is the guy every time this is the guy eventually they had to let him go because they had no evidence but we'll get to that okay the coroner fixed the time of death this is about the six year old girl by the way between twelve thirty and one a.m. and stated that a very sharp knife had been used to expert expertly dismember the body. A basement laundry room near the Degnan's home was located in which it appeared the Degnan had been dismembered, though it was determined that she was already dead when she was taken there. A coroner's expert stated that the killer was either a man who worked in a profession that required the study of anatomy or one with a background in dissection. Not even the average doctor could be as skillful. It had to be a meat cutter. Now bear in mind, right, uh, the description of William George Hirons... Uh, the only thing he actually did, like I said, apart from his petty thievery, he worked as an usher and a docent. He had no background of anatomy, medical uh, teachings, or anything like that. The police arrested at least six, six to seven people, if I remember. They arrested more people than that, but the, these six to uh, seven, I think it's seven people, they were adamant, this is our guy. This is our guy for the, the murder of uh, Suzanne Degnan. The first one was Hector Verbo. 65-year-old Hector Verbo, a janitor in the building where Degnan lived, was arrested and touted as the suspect. Police told the press, this is the man. 
despite discrepancies between Virgo's profile and the one that was developed by them as to what kind of skills the killer had. So again, this person they arrested had nothing to do with medical, uh, had any medical knowledge or anything like that, and that you know, knowledge of anatomy. He was a janitor. I'm not saying janitors don't know shit, but he didn't have medical knowledge. Police cited such evidence as Verbo's frequenting the so-called murder room and the grimy state of the ransom note suggested it was written by a dirty hand such as that of a janitor. It's 1945, you know, so <laughs> that kind of detail could be anything, I, you know, just because it was written by a dirty hand. I have dirty hands now and again, I work in a printing company. But, but anyway. The police pressured Verbo's wife to implicate her husband in the murder. Police held Verbo for 48 hours of questions and beatings, which we'll get to in the future as well. That severely injured him, including a separated shoulder, throughout. V Verbo denied involvement in, in the murder. Uh, the Janta's union lawyer got Verbo released on a writ of habeas corpus. Verbo said of the experience, They hand me up, they blindfolded me. I can't put up my arms, they are sore. They had handcuffs on me for hours and hours. They threw me in the cell and blindfolded me. They handcuffed my, eye, my hands between my back and pulled me up on the bars until my toes touched the floor. I didn't eat, I, go, I went to the hospital, or oh, I'm sick anymore, and I would have confessed to anything. So they basically tortured him for 48 hours. It's proven torture methods, by the way. Torture don't bloody work. Yeah, torture doesn't work. It just makes you confess to things you never never thought you would confess to. But he was tortured for 48 hours, this Hector Verbo. But they let him, they eventually had to let him go. But anyway, the next one. Sidney Sherman. Another notable false lead was that of Sidney Sherman, a recently discharged Marine who had served in World War II. Police had found blonde hairs in the back of Degnam's apartment building, and nearby was a wire that authorities had suspected could have been used as a garrote to strangle Susan Degnam. Near that was a handkerchief the police suspected might have been used as a gag to keep Susan quiet. On the handkerchief was a laundry mark named S. Sherman. The police hoped that perhaps the killer had erred in, in leaving in it behind. They searched military records and discovered that Sidney Sherman lived at Hyde Park YMCA. The police went to question Sherman but discovered that he had vacated the residence without checking out and quit his job without picking up his last paycheck. That's suspicious, I must admit. A nationwide manhunt ensued. Sherman was found four days later in Toledo, Ohio. He explained under interrogation that he had eloped with his girlfriend and denied that the handkerchief was his. He was administered a polygraph test which he passed and was later cleared. Now, polygraph tests, they are unreliable. They, they are no longer used in the court of law because they are so unreliable. You could take a polygraph test one day, pass it without fail. You could take the same polygraph the next day. If you had a bad day or your anxiety was up or whatever, you would fail that polygraph test. This is why they no longer use them in most court of laws. The handkerchief's, the handkerchief's real owner, Eamon Seymour Sherman of New York City, was eventually found. He had been out of the country when Susan Degnan was murdered. He had no idea how it could possibly have ended up in Chicago, and the presence of the handkerchief was determined to be a coincidence. I'm not, but by the way, I'm not saying this Sid Sidney Sherman is guilty or innocent in any way. I'm not giving that an opinion, but... Bear in mind now, this, this Eamon Seymour Sherman, whose handkerchief was actually found at the scene, the handkerchief was found near the girl, the wire they, which they think was used on Susan Degnan, but they put it down as coincidence. Now, it could 100% be coincidence, So, but they were very quick to get to that, and they didn't, from all accounts, they did not um, interrogate in the way of torture, if you know what I mean. So that was just two of a few. Now, by, by February 1946, Susan had already been buried. More of her remains were found by sewer workers about a half a mile from her home. By April, uh, 370 suspects were questioned and cleared. By this time, the press were taking an increasingly critical tone as to how the police were handling the Degnan investigation. So the police were basically basically hounded. You know, be, they were they were be call, being called fools in the media. They were constantly, you know, being told they're incompetent. They were getting the police were getting angry. They were already brutal against these suspects. The police, you know, they were maybe maybe they were um, they were tensions were heightened because of the situation of the uh, case. You know, with a six year old girl, the police constantly beat suspects, tortured suspects in during interrogation. You know, not the way you should do it, but and they were getting a lot of flack in the media because of it. They arrested someone else, Richard Russell Thomas. 
uh, was a nurse living in Phoenix, Arizona, having moved from Chicago at the time of the Chicago investigation. He was imprisoned in Phoenix for with one of his daughters, but he was in Chicago at the time of the Degna murder. A handwriting expert for the Phoenix Police Department first informed Chicago authorities of the great similarities between Thomas's handwriting and that of Degna ransom note. Noting that many of the phrases Thomas had used in the extortion note was similar and his medical training as a nurse matched the profile suggested by police. So, you know, that's that, that's a lot of um, connections you could make to that case of this Richard Russell Thomas. But we'll move on. Although Thomas lived on the south side, he frequented a car yard directly across the street from where Susan Degnan's remains were found. During questioning by Chicago police, he freely admitted... Ki- he freely admitted Lynn Susan Degnan. However, the authorities were intrigued by a promising new suspect reported to the paper the same day as Thomas' development broke. A college student was caught fleeing the scene of a burglary, brandished the gun at police, and possibly tried to kill one of the pursuing policemen to escape. By this time, Thomas had recanted his confession, but the press didn't notice in light of his new lead. So this Richard Ro- Russell Thomas, which was known for, how can I say, in the, without got into detail messing with his own daughter right scumbag but he confessed and he, he didn't confess which we'll get to in a minute now he didn't confess under drugs or interrogation he confessed okay and then recanted his confession when the police had a new lead or new suspect i should say bear that in mind with that richard russell thomas who hit, who was known to target younger I mean, that's all we'll get to on that one but anyway So the arrest and questioning of William George Hirons, okay? So on June 26, 1946, 17-year-old William Hirons was arrested for attempted burglary. During the scuffle, he was knocked unconscious by several blows to the head. According to Hirons, he drifted into unconsciousness under a question and was interrogated under the clock for six days, beaten and starved. He was not allowed to see his parents for four days. He was also refused the opportunity to speak to a lawyer for six days. Two psychiatrists, Dr. Haynes and Roy Grinker, gave Hirons sodium pentothal. Now, if you don't know what sodium pentothal is, it used to be touted as truth serum. It's not truth serum, it's a barbiturate, which basically relaxes your defences and... If I remember correctly, thiopental is still used in places such as India as a truth serum to weaken the resolve of a subject and make the individual more compliant to pressure. Barbiturates decrease both higher cortical brain function and inhibition. Some psychiatrists hypothesize, now bear in mind they hypothesize, there is no truth to it, it's just an hypothesis, that because lying is more complex than telling the truth, suppression of the higher cortical functions may lead to the uncovering of the truth. The drug tends to make subjects verbose and cooperative with interrogators. However, the reliability of confessions made under the- theopental is questionable. I think that's highly bloody que- questionable, if you ask me. There is no proof that it makes you tell the truth. That's all it does. It 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 lowers your defenses and you know lowers your your willingness to f- say, for example, now if someone was interrogating you. And you're adamant you're innocent, but this drug would make you think, "Oh, fuck! I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to admit to it, even though I didn't do it. I'm just going to admit to it, so I can get out of this situation." That's what sodium pentothal does. I don't know who these psychiatrists are. You know, they're more intelligent than I am. I don't know if this is psychiatrists from the 1940s or 1950s. I have no idea. It, it is a hypothesis. It's not truth. It's not fact. They hypothesize that it, that because lying is more complex than telling the truth, it helps with it, you know, it lowers the defences of liars, basically. That's what they think. But anyway, moving on. So they gave him sodium pentadol without a warrant and without hirings or parents or his parents' consent and interrogated him for three hours. Under the influence of the drugs, authorities claimed Hirons spoke of an alternate personality named George who had actually committed the murders. Hirons claimed that he recalled the little of the drug-induced interrogation that when police asked for George's last name, he said he couldn't remember. But, the, it, but that it was a murmuring name. Police translated this to Merman, and the media later dramatised it to Murder Man. What Hirons actually said is in dispute, as the original transcript, transcript has disappeared. In 1952, Dr. Grinker revealed that Hirons had never implicated himself in any of the killings. So, like I said, he was interrogated for six days. Then he was given the sodium pentothal, which basically, you know, anyone who is tortured and, you know, beaten... Uh, for six days or a couple of days, doesn't doesn't matter. 
it's been known that it's, you, you can look at this up in various um, documents throughout history that torture doesn't work. It basically, the, the majority of people who get tortured and interrogated in that way, they'll admit to anything. They'll admit to anything just to make it stop. Bear that in mind. So on his fifth day in custody, Hirons was given a lumbar puncture without anesthesia. Sorry, a lumbar puncture. Puncture. I don't know what they gave him a lumbar puncture for. A lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap, is a medical procedure in which a needle is inserted into the spinal canal. Most commonly, commonly to collect cerebrospinal fluid, I can't say that probably, for diagnostic testing. Sometimes lumbar puncture cannot be performed safely, for example, due to a se severe bleeding tendency. Yeah, I'm not sure why they gave him a lumbar puncture, because from what I tell is to extract spinal fluid, DNA maybe, but this is 1946, they had nothing, no knowledge of DNA, um, science back then so i don't know why they did that and they did it without anesthesia moments later higher was driven to police headquarters for a polygraph test they tried a few times to administer administer the test but it was rescheduled for several days later after they found him to be in too much pain to cooperate when the polygraph was administered authorities including state's attorney william tui announced that the results were inconclusive inconclusive basically means they don't know. <laughs> That's basically what that means. On July 2nd, 1946, he was transferred to Cook County Jail where he was placed in the infirmary to recover. So Hiram's confession, okay? After the sodium pentatol questioning, but before the polygram exam, Hiram spoke to Captain Michael Ahern with State Attorney William Tui and a stenographer at hand. Hiram's offered an indirect confession confirming his claim while under so sodium pentatol. That his alter, alter ego, George Merman. Now, bear, bear in mind, one, he was under the uh, the sodium pentatol influences when he said this. And also that he is now using George Merman only because the police said they think it sounds like Merman. So that he's basically, basically a, you know, in one form or another, acknowledging their total guess of what that surname was or what the second name was. But anyway... George, which happens to be his father's first name and Hiram's middle name, had given him the loot to... This is what he was saying, by, by the way, under his confession, under the influence of the drug. Had given him the loot to hide in his dormitory room. Police hunted all over for this. George, questioning Hiram's known friends, family and associations, but came away empty-handed. Hiram's was attributed as saying, while under the influence, that he met George when he was 13 years old. That it was George who sent him out prowling at, prowling at night and he robbed for pleasure and killed like a cobra when cornered. George related his secrets to Hirons. Hirons allegedly claimed that he was always taking the rap for George. First for petty theft, then assault and now murder. Psychologists explained at the time that in the same way children make up imaginary friends, Hirons made up his personality to keep his antisocial feelings and actions separate from the person who, who could be the average son and student, date night schools and go to church. Authorities were sceptical regarding Hirons' claims and suspected that he was laying the groundwork for an insanity defence, but the confession earned widespread publicity with the press transfer transforming merman to murder man so again it was the press who changed the surname from from first of all to murmur then to merman then to murder man guilty by the press so far but anyway we'll move on right so here's the hard evidence they list okay while handwriting analysts did not definitively link Hiram's handwriting into the lipstick message. Police claimed that his fingerprints matched the print discovered at the scene of Francis Brown murder. It was reported as a bloody smudge on the door jam. Furthermore, a fingerprint on the left little finger also allegedly connected Hiram's to the ransom note with nine points of comparison. The FBI at the time in 1940s needed 12 points of comparison, but the police of Chicago took 9 points. As Hiram's 9 points of comparison were loops, this could also provide a match to 65% of the population. At the time, Hiram's supporters pointed out that the FBI handbook regarding fingerprint identification required 12 points of comparison, matching to have a positive identification. On June 30th, 1946, Captain Emmett Evans told newspapers that Hiram's had been cleared of suspicion in the Brown murder as the fingerprint left in the apartment was not his. Twelve days later, Chief of Detectives Walter Stones confirmed that the bloody sluts, the bloody smudge left on the door jam was Hiram's. So first of all, they cleared him. 
Because I did see a picture. This is the best picture I can find of the fingerprints. The top one was a rolled print from a fingerprint card. So basically William's uh, fingerprint. The bottom fingerprint is what was found on an object. I think it, it, um, it was the ransom note they were talking about. Now, to me, they don't look that same, but I'm not a fingerprint expert, okay? So I'm not going to go into whatever that is. But the fact is that they didn't have enough evidence of fingerprint uh, technology back then. So, But they got it as close as they could. But anyway, we'll move on. They also found some stolen, item, stolen items in Iron's dormitory, which we're going to list. So police searches without war without a warrant of Hiram's residence and college dormitory found out I found other items that earned publicity. Notably recovered was a scrapbook containing pictures of Nazi officials that belonged to a war veteran. Uh, Harry Gold. That was taken when Hiram's burgled his place that the night Susan Degnan was killed. Gold lived in the vicinity of the Degnans. This once again put Hiram's in the circle of suspicion. So he was, in, he was in the area at least, but he did live close to this area, so it was something he would frequent anyway. Also in Hiram's possession was a stolen copy of Psychopathia Sexualis. I don't know what that is. A, a book about sexual pathology and focuses on male homosexuality, the antipathetic instinct of the subtitle. There was a book about homosexuality. Nothing to write home about on that one. And the other book he had was Richard Von Kraft's famous study of the sexual deviance. In addition, among Hiram's belongings, police discovered a stolen medical kit, but they announced that the medical instruments could not be linked to the murders. No trace of biological material such as blood, skin or hair were found on the tools. Moreover, no biological material of the victims were found on Hiram's himself or any of his clothes. The medical kit tools were considered to be too fine and small to be used for dissection. So basically, when it came to the murder of that Susan Degnan, there was a lot of things happening. I get, like I said, I'm not going to go into detail, but the tools they found, they said there was no way they, that those were the tools used because they were just too small. Uh, instead, Hirons had used a four inch long medical kit to alter the war, bon war bonds he stole. Basically, um, from what I read a while ago, a couple of days ago, he used to steal war bonds because obviously this was right after World War II. So he would steal war bonds and cash them in. You know, shit stained stuff to do, but but anyway, move on. A gun was found in his possession that was linked to a shooting. A Colt police positive revolver had been stolen in a burglary at the apartment of Guy Roderick on December 3rd, 1945. Two nights later, a bullet crashed through the, the closed 8th floor uh, apartment window of Marion Caldwell. Wounding her, Hirons had that gun in his possession, and according to the Chicago Police Department, the bullet that injured Caldwell was linked through ballistics to the same gun. So they... The, he did have a gun which did fire a bullet through a window and wounded someone. Don't know if they were, you know, we, we'll never know if he was aiming for the window, if it was an accidental discharge or if he was aiming for someone else. We'll never know that. But he did have a gun and the bullet was linked to a wounding, not a murder. Right, this is one of the eyewitness things. A witness told police he saw a figure walking toward the Degnan residence with a shopping bag. He described the man as 5 feet 9 inches tall, 170 pounds, 35 years old and wearing a light coloured fedora and a dark overcoat. But could not make out the man's face. The witness did not recognise a photo of Hirons as showing the man he saw. But a few days later he identified Hirons in person at a court hearing. So the, the witness looked at the photo of Hirons and said no that's not the guy. And then uh, in... In uh, an in-person identification, said yes, that's the guy. Don't know why, but you know maybe maybe he looked different in the photo. Who knows? Before the trial, inconsistencies in the witness' original statement had led many to dismiss his evidence. In court, it was pointed out that the witness told police that darkness had prevented him seeing the man's face. While in court, he testified that they had seen Hirons walk in front of the car's headlights. So, at one case, the witness said. I couldn't see it, it was too dark, I couldn't see his face. Then another case he said, yeah, I saw his face, I could see it in the car headlights. So there's two contradicting stories that this witness gave forward. Don't know, maybe he was coerced, maybe he, he forgot, or maybe it was something else. I don't know, maybe it was another motive, but anyway. Alright, Hiram's second confession. So Hiram's defense attorney felt he was guilty. Their task, they believed, was to save Hiram from the electric chair. Tui, on the other hand, was not certain he could get a conviction. 
A small likelihood of a successful murder prosecution of William Harris early prompted the state's attorney office to seek out and obtain the cooperative help of defence counsel and through them that of their client. All the prosecution had in the Degnan case was a partial fingerprint on the ransom note. A partial fingerprint, by the way. And it was at this stage of the investigation that defence counsel moved forward in cooperation with my office, state's attorney Tui. Hiram's lawyers pressured him to take Tui's plea bargain. That deal, which was the topic of the closed door meeting with Tui, states that Hiram would serve one life sentence if he confessed to the murders of Josephine Ross, Francis Brown and Susan Degnan. With the help of his lawyers, he began drafting the confession using the Chicago Tri Tribune article as a guide. Now bear in mind, he confessed again, or he, he continued with his confession, I should say. You know, if he didn't confess, it would be the chair. If he did confess, it would be life in prison. Some people, you know, would choose the latter, but, you know, he was 17 years old, so who knows. As it turned out, the Tribune article was very helpful as it provided me with a lot of details I didn't know. My attorneys rarely changed anything outright, but I couldn't, but I could tell by their faces if I had made a mistake. Or they would say, now Bill, is that really the way it happened? Then I would change my story because obviously it went against what was known in the tri Tribune. So he's basically, they were telling him what to say. And he was, they, they were making him change certain things in his story to make it fit this tribune. Both Hirons and his parents signed the confession. The parties agreed to a date of July 30th for Hirons to make his official confession. On that date, the defence went to Tui's office, where several reporters were assembled to ask Hirons questions, and where Tui himself made a speech. Hirons appeared bewildered and gave non-committal answers to reporters' questions, which years later blamed on Tui. It was, it, this is him saying now. It was Tui himself, after assembling all the officials, including attorneys and policemen, he began his preamble about how long everyone had waited to get a confession from me. But at last, the truth was going to be told. He kept emphasising the word truth, and I asked him if he really wanted the truth. He assured me that he did. Now, Tui made a big deal about hearing the truth. Now, when I was being forced to lie to save myself, he made me angry, so I told him the truth, and everyone got very upset. Tui withdrew the previously agreed sentence of one life term with a few minor charges, changed it to a three life term to run consecutively, and threatened Hirons with death penalty if he went to trial. They threatened to charge him with another murder, Estelle Carey, even though Hirons was attending the Gibbalt School for Wayward Boys, a boarding school in Terre Haute, I don't know how to say that, to apologize, Indiana. Hirons' own attorneys were angry at the client for engaging in the plea, go plea bargain, spurring the Chicago tri Tribune headline, Mute Hirons Faces Trial, Killer Spoon's Mother's Fervent Plea to Talk. So they were trying to put another murder on him if he didn't go for this plea, which there was no evidence for him being anywhere near this other person who got murdered, but they were going to, you know, they were threatening to pin it on him if he didn't cooperate it cooperate so you know there's that uh, Tui announced that he would press ahead to try Hirons for the death of Susan Degnus and Francis Brown Hirons agreed with the new plea agreement the public allocation was held again in Tui's office this time Hirons talked and answered questions even reenacting parts of the murder to which he had confessed Ahern changed his opinion believed he was culpable when he heard how familiar Hirons was with victim Francis Brown's apartment Hirons later said, I confess to save my life. Going on more about Hirons' confession, like I said, which was helped along by his attorney and the prosecution. In his confession, Hirons stated that he disposed of the hunting knife of which he said he had Susan Degnan on the elevated subway tracks near the scene of the murder. The police never searched the L tracks. However, learning of this, reporters inquired with the track crew if they had found a knife. They had found it on the tracks and they kept it at the Granville Station storage room. The reporters determined that the knife belonged to Guy Roderick, the same person who had his Colt positive 22 caliber gun stolen and found in Hiram's possession. On July 31st, he positively, positively identified the, the knife as his. Hirons acknowledged that he, he threw the knife there for, from the L train, claiming he didn't want his mother to see it. So, Hirons took full responsibility for the three murders on August 7, 1946. The prosecution had him reenact the crime in Degnam home in public and in front of the press. On September 4th, the, with Hirons' parents and the victim's families attending with, and Chief Justice Harold G. Ward presiding. Hirons admitted his guilt on the burglary and murder charges. That night, Hirons tried to end himself in his cell, timed to coincide during a shift change of the prison guards. He was discovered before he died. He said later that despair drove him to attempt, you know what, uh, this is his words. Everyone believed I was guilty. If I weren't alive, I felt I could avoid being a judge guilty by the law and thereby gain some victory. But I wasn't successful even at that. 
Before I walked into the courtroom, my counsel told me to just enter a plea of guilty and keep my mouth shut after it. I didn't even have a trial. On September 5th, after further evidence was written into a record and prosecution and defence had made their closing statements, Ward formally sentenced Hirons to three life terms. As Hirons waited to be transferred to Statesville Prison from the Cook County Jail, Sheriff Michael McCarley asked Hirons if Susan Degnan suffered when she was killed. Hirons answered, I can't tell you if she suffered, Sheriff McCarley, I didn't kill her. Tell Mr Degnan to please look after his daughter because whoever kills Suzanne is still out there. Now this was directly after he had, you know, been sentenced to three life sentences. He was never getting out of jail. You know, 1946, the chances of getting out of jail through uh, through new evidence was extremely slim back in those days. So he knew he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail. So there was no reason to, you know, not admit to it by then. But he said, I can't tell you if she suffered. I didn't kill her. This was dr- straight after being laid out of the court. So there's that. Within days of his confession in open court, Hirons denied any responsibility for the murders. Mary Jane Blanchard, daughter of the murder victim Josephine Ross, was one of the first dissenters, being quoted in 1946 as saying, I cannot believe that young Hirons murdered my mother. He does not fit into the picture of my mother's death. I have looked at all things Hirons stole and there was nothing of my mother's things among them. So even one of the victim's relatives believed he didn't do it. Right, this is they're talking they're talking about the confession now and the, about the inconsistencies in his confession. Now obviously if there's a lot of inconsistencies is probably because the prosecution and his lawyer were telling him what to say certain things and obviously they got things mixed up. 29 inconsistencies have been found between his confession and the known facts of the crime. It has since become the understanding that the nature of these inconsistencies is a clear indicator of false confessions. Some details did seem to match, like the police theory that Susan Degnan was dismembered by a hunting knife and Hirons confessed to throwing a hunting knife into a section of the Chicago subway near the Degnan residence. However, it was never determined scientifically that it was at least the dismemberment tool. So basically, the knife he said he threw into the, the section of the Chicago subway was never proven to be the knife that uh, murdered that six-year-old girl it was never proven it was just a knife he had on him which you know he was a pet he was a petty thief he had a gun probably carried a knife quite often you know for whatever reason it's 1946 who knows this alternative suspect now they're talking about Richard Russell Thomas the person who was convicted of messing with his daughter, if you know what I mean, and actually confessed to the murder of Susan Degnan, but then recanted his confession as soon as he found out there was another suspect. But these are the the thing, uh, the similarities they're talking were of Richard Russell Thomas. So, upon being questioned, Thomas confessed to the crime, but he was released from custody after Hirons became the prime suspect. Others contend that Thomas was a strong suspect. These are the reasons why they think he was a strong suspect. Thomas previously had been convicted of an attempted extortion with a ransom note that threatened the kidnapping of a little girl. Now that is a that to me is a big bloody uh, flag right there. The murder of Susan Degnan, when she was taken, a, nans- a ransom note appeared demanding money or, you know, I hurt this little girl. That's exactly what Richard Thomas himself did. Didn't get away with it, thankfully. But he actually got convicted for that very same crime. As previously noted, handwriting experts at the time stated that Thomas's ransom note from his previous conviction of extortion bears similarity in both style in regard to the wording and in form of the actual structure of the letters formed to the Degnan ransom note. So basically, he worded things similarly. Um, he worded things in a similar way. The way he spelt words was very similar. Thomas was in Chicago at the time of the Degnan murder. At the time he confessed to the Degnan crime, he was awaiting sentences for messing with his daughter. Thomas had a history of violence, including spousal abuse. Thomas was a nurse who was known to masquerade as a surgeon. He often boasted to his friends that he was the doctor and he was known to steal surgical supplies. Chicago police had previously developed the profile of the Degnam killer as having surgical skills or being a butcher. So basically, the the coroner for the Susan Degnam case said the way her remains were dismembered, uh, you would have had to have had uh, knowledge of anatomy or some surgical knowledge you know the coroner said that so 
and this Thomas did seem to have that kind of knowledge. He frequented the car agency near the Degnan residence. Parts of Susan Degnan's body was found in a sewer across the street from the car agency. Like Hirons, he was a known burglar. He had confessed freely to the Degnan murder, although he later recanted. The Chicago detectives dismissed Thomas' claims after Hirons became a suspect. Thomas died in 1974 in an Arizona prison. His prison record and most of the evidence of his interrogation regarding the Chicago murders have been lost or destroyed. So yeah, that Richard Thomas, now like I said, I'm not saying in any way whether he was innocent or guilty. He was definitely guilty of certain other shitbag, horrible shit. The connections between him and the Susan Degnam case is extremely close. And I think in today's uh, course, that would be looked at very very uh, closely but anyway moving on so this was after Hirons was arrested and went to prison his parents and younger brother changed their surname to Hill his parents divorced after his conviction Hirons was housed in Stateville prison at Joliet Illinois he learned several trades including elect electronics and television and radio repair at one point he even had his own repair shop he got a college education and in 1972, became the first prisoner in Illinois history to earn a four-year college degree, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree. So he, he did a lot of stuff in prison. Petition for clemency. In 2002, Lawrence C. Marshall filed a petition on Hiram's behalf seeking clemency. The appeal was eventually denied. Former Los Angeles police officer Steve Hodel, who had spent 25 years on the force, met Hirons in 2003 when he was investigating the murder, murders. He was convinced that Hirons was innocent of the crimes. I felt compelled to write an appeal to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board stating my professional belief that Hirons was innocent. Hirons' most recent parole hearing was held on July 26, 2007. The Illinois Prisoner Review Board decision in a 14-0 vote against parole was reflected by board member Thomas Johnson who stated that God will forgive you but the state won't. However, the parole board also decided to revisit the issue once per year from then on. Uh, after being taken to the University of Illinois Medical Center on February 26, 2012, due to complications with diabetes, Hirons died on March 5, 2012, at the age of 83. So he died in prison with, with never getting, you know, and by the way, from the, from the moment he left the court as 17 year old, he, he fully, um, proclaimed his innocence till his dying breath. He never confessed to anyone in prison, never confessed again in prison. He only ever confessed under drug uh, influence of the sodium pentothal and in the courts when his lawyer and the prosecution told him exactly what to say. As soon as he left that court, he, he recanted his confession and didn't, re didn't officially recant it, proclaimed it to his dying day. So, look, I d like I said, I'm... I'm not a police officer, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think, I don't know, it, to me, the, the evidence points to him being innocent. If you ask me, I, when I was listening to this on the podcast, I couldn't believe what I was listening to. I thought, why is this person in a serial killer podcast? And then when I started looking into him, he's still classed as a serial killer. Well, actually, he's classed as a possible serial killer, but he still shows up in serial killer lists, which I, I don't think he should be. I don't think he should be. Yes, he was a burglar. He, he was a petty thief. He burglared homes. For, to me, all the evidence points to him being totally innocent of those murders, if you ask me. I'm not saying that's the case. This is just my opinion. This is what I can t see from everything I've read. Everything I've read over the last couple of days, by the way. Everything I've listened to as well. And he's still classed, he's still classed as a serial killer. I don't know. I think this should be looked into, if you ask me. I think even though you know, he's passed on now, he's dead now, it doesn't matter. I still think this should be reopened. Maybe he has descendants somewhere who would like to know. And maybe the descendants of the people who were murdered would like to know. You know, Because at the end of the day, whoever, if he didn't do it, the person who did do it still had his, you know, went on to do other things. Who knows? I just thought it was really interesting. Like I said, I'm not saying whether he's guilty or innocent. The, the evidence to me points to him to be in, totally innocent of everything there. The only confession he said was coerced through influence of drugs and through his prosecution and lawyer. So, I don't know. 
I don't know. I just, I just wanted this. I know this was a stupidly long video. And we'll get back to the fun, fluffy stuff after this. Because this is quite dark. But I, I just... I couldn't not talk about this. Because it... it because, I, like I said, I, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing when I started to listen to this podcast. So I hope you enjoyed. And like I said, apologies, it's not my usual fun stuff. But, you know, now and again, stuff like this intrigues me. And let me know in the comments down below. What do you, what do you think? I'll, I'll link this. I'll link everything you need to look at. I know I just read a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff I, I left out. Not because, you know, it wasn't interesting. It's just because it didn't need to be in there because it was in other parts. But I'll link this source down below. And other sources if you want to go check it out yourself and let me know your conclusions what you think if you think he's guilty don't be afraid to say so you know like i said i am not a police officer i am not a lawyer i'm not a psychiatrist i am not an expert in anything i'm just giving an opinion so you are feel feel free to give your opposite opinion to me please but anyway that's it uh, leave a like if you like this video leave a sub if you're new to my channel i do these quite often and that's it i hope you enjoyed thanks for watching bye for now